So, uh, again, let me welcome you here on the Good Data Meetup. Uh, it's the second edition. First time uh, we've met here approximately two months ago. So you can see uh, we are spinning up uh, next uh, event uh, not uh, planned yet. Summer on the horizon, perhaps uh, something in the, spring, in the fall. Uh, stay tuned, follow our pages, and we will keep you uh, up to date. Today's discussion will focus on AI and uh, the future of AI, uh, its impact to the software development, uh, education, general uh, society, uh, etc. So for the discussion, I have the honor to welcome our distinguished speakers. Let me introduce them from the window. So the first one is Pavel Wimmer. Pavel is a founder and CEO of the company DNAI. So obviously artificial intelligence is here embedded into the DNA of the company, certainly not just into the name. Uh, DNAI turns latest AI research to, into production and businesses and helps companies to grow and survive in edge cases. Pavel is also interested in psychology and exponential technologies and its transformational potential when implemented into real life. So, Pavel Wimmer. Uh, second speaker is Tomáš Mikolov. Tomáš is a scientist and he is considered a pioneer of a statistical models for speech recognition, as well as he is known as the inventor of a famous word to vec method that significantly improved and sped up the work of Google Translator. I'm sure with uh, the all uh, AI hype, you have already heard some uh, podcast or, or, or heard uh, Tomáš speaking. I'm sure you are kind of familiar with his professional career. He graduated at Brno University of Technology, went through the research internships at Johns Hopkins University, Montreal University, and then he went through Microsoft, Google, Facebook corporations. Now he's back as active research scientist at Czech Institute of Informatics, Robotics and Kybernetics at Czech Technical University. Tomáš Mikolov. Okay. And the last one, uh, Roman Staněk is home, home ground, <laughs> uh, home facility. Uh, Roman is seasoned entrepreneur, industry expert uh, with many years of experience. Uh, he is the founder of a Good Data and uh, his Good Data journey continues. Good Data keeps developing composable data and analytics platform. And uh, before Good Data, Roman founded, built and sold NetBeans and Sistinet. I'm sure that they are also kind of familiar with this uh, story. Roman is based in San Francisco, but he frequently visits uh, our offices here in Prague to meet with the people here. And we have used this opportunity uh, this time to bring him into the discussion. So, Roman Staněk. Okay, so. Let's get started. First, I wanted to make clear uh, about what we are going to talk about. Uh, the topic is AI, artificial intelligence, but uh, I wanted to restrict a bit for the beginning uh, the, the scope. Uh, there is obviously this generative AI with all the language models and GPTs, etc. And then there is this artificial intelligence, uh, artificial general intelligence. Right? These two things are sort of uh, different. Uh, the AGI concept is uh, more broad, or I would say defined as something that can learn to accomplish any intellectual tasks that human beings or other animals can perform even better. While on the contrary, the large language models and uh, GPTs uh, are more like generative uh, approaches, therefore, based on the input that it receives, it generates some outputs, but it does not think itself on its own, uh, and so on. So let's, uh, uh, we are not there yet. The AGI still hasn't been, to, hasn't been uh, developed, invented, but uh, everybody is curious uh, when this is going to happen. So I have this warm-up question. When do you think the AGI will be here, alive, perhaps? 
not here in this building, but uh, perhaps in some lab, maybe like Czech Technical University. If I am supposed to start, uh, well, I don't know, it's like a wild guess because uh, you can just uh, say some number and then uh, nobody actually keeps uh, keeps record of this. That's uh, that's a thing that I remember like a couple of uh, years ago when the journalists were asking uh, some scientists uh, questions about their predictions when the self-driving cars will be around. And some people would say like two years, some would say like 10 years, some would say 20 years. Uh, and some people were completely wrong. and. Uh, Nobody cares anymore. Nobody remembers their responses. So I can just uh, say some random number here today. I don't think it will really matter. Uh, I think that uh, what you said before, that uh, AGI is not here, that's one point that I would agree uh, with, that I think it's, uh, it's good to say that AGI is really supposed to be the thing, like uh, that uh, things like people that can do pretty much anything, that has the capability to learn, which is actually important uh, because in the context of language models that uh, they are like uh, trained on internet data, they can mimic a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, processes that people do. They can uh, say jokes, uh, they can do a lot of things, uh, but uh, they are not AGI because uh, they can't learn like uh, we do. They can't really like invent some radically new concepts and build on top of them, which is uh, not that easy to define. You know, like uh, it's uh, it's hard to really like make some make some claim. Okay, this is not AGI. And this already is. Uh, it's not like a binary thing. So I think that uh, gradually we will be building better and better systems that can do more and more of the work typically typically humans do. And at some point uh, these systems. Uh, will be probably good enough that they will be able to kind of le learn on their own, kind of like expand their knowledge, expand in complexity, kind of like evolve like DNA, DNA right? Uh, like uh, without having this uh, upper ceiling, upper bound. Uh, and then I think that we will have this AGI and whether it will take like 20 or 30 years, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm uh, I'm sure that uh, still new research is needed. Uh, maybe one one cute idea can get us there in like uh, maybe two or three years from now. But I think more realistically speaking, uh, my guess would be like 20 to 30 years, something like that. But again, nobody keeps record of this and nobody cares. Once we will have a uh, AGI, like the real one, uh, nobody will uh, need to have any discussions whether we already have it or not because it will be completely obvious. And then all our predictions will not matter anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I remember Roman was uh, talking at Czech University some time ago about the self-driving cars for you. Yeah, yeah. I, a couple of years ago, I said, you know, enjoy driving. You know, soon you will not be able to drive because the insurance for self-driving be so much lower. Uh, I think I was off by, I don't know how many years. But uh, I think what's, what's really interesting about it is that, you know, I, again, I don't know if it's 20 years, 30 years, whatever. You know, we invented computers less than, what, 70 years ago. So going from no computers to AGI in essentially 100 years, I think that's kind of scary if you think about what will happen in the next 1,000 years. You know, so that's kind of that speed of innovation, that kind of uh, exponential spe speed of innovation that computers brought to human society is uh, unbelievable. And again, going from no computers to AGI in 100 years, and then you did, you kind of say what will happen in the next 100 years and, and so on. So I think these are some of the, you know, super interesting questions that um, we will find out what's going to happen in 20 years. So we will see, but it's interesting. Okay, well, I guess uh, many of us will still be here in 20 years. Uh, so. Let's see. For now, uh, let's uh, let's keep focused on the uh, generative AI and uh, the buzz and the hype that uh, has been triggered by the uh, open AI making uh, accessible their uh, chat GPT. If uh, if we really just focus to this, I think we had a brief discussion before uh, before we started. For some people, it's not really much of a revolution because everything was here before. It's just made public now. But uh, others, people who were not uh, or were not familiar with uh, with the, the research, uh, they try to compare this uh, evolution and uh, now the, the huge boom of uh, of the large language models to something like industrial revolution. Or maybe I was thinking uh, Gutenberg's letterpress, right? So we were pressing books or, or printing books then. Now with the uh, with the chat GPTs or, or GPTs in general, we are generating more and more content. Uh, would you be able to somehow compare these events or you have some other events in the history that uh, would be good to compare this with this? I 
I, I think uh, that uh, from from our experience, it's not uh, only about GPT. Uh, I, I know that that uh, there is big big hype, and now many demand uh, we have uh, about some cognitive assistance, for example, for lawyers, uh, like also sales assistant, or also specific solution for finding relevant data. But uh, it's it's not only about uh, GPT. Uh, we are we are building uh, we are building uh, many interesting solutions. For example, in in construction design, uh, also a special application for uh, for healthcare industry. Uh, but what's a big difference is uh, I think uh, popularization because uh, before uh, GPT. Uh, we present that uh, companies uh, need to uh, apply uh, AI because it's a big, uh, big advantage. And they don't believe us because uh, uh, it was only a theory. But now uh, they can use GPT. They have uh, experience and they see that uh, there is huge potential, for example, for, for helping them with uh, daily work. And now uh, they are focusing also uh, where next they can uh, apply uh, artificial intelligence. And if we discuss with them, uh, they told us that uh, it was, it is uh, absolutely uh, change, change maker for, for the industry. And now we are starting uh, with, with, with application. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, my opinion is that it's something uh, like uh, companies uh, set up IT department, similar it, it will be uh, in the context of AI. And now the, the latest uh, companies uh, set up uh, AI lakes, uh, AI, uh, AI managers, and I, I predict that it, it will be same like uh, with, with IT department. This is my opinion. Okay, thank you very much. So let's uh, let's jump straight into the software development, right? Uh, I have a couple of questions here related. Uh, everybody is aware that the large language models uh, can generate output in many languages, including programming languages, if they are trained on. So this is something we cannot ignore, uh, as it will certainly have significant impact on the work of a software engineers and we can see it in these days there is this copilot by gitlab that uh, many people are already uh, utilizing uh, right now so how different will be the job done by software engineers software developers yep. okay maybe maybe i can start uh, well i think uh, that uh, the job of uh, software developers has been uh, like evolving quite quickly because it was already mentioned that uh, maybe 70 years ago we didn't have computers and then uh, when the first computers were actually created uh, people used to code in uh, in the machine code so they would have to memorize uh, all the all the numbers for instructions and uh, when uh, when somebody actually did come up with a shortcut uh, which was called like assembler like assembly language uh, then it was uh, considered by the old school uh, programmers uh, as something uh, unnecessary like uh, that everybody should memorize these uh, tables of instructions in their heads and uh, assembler was uh, supposed to be written and of course uh, we know the history uh, then uh, then basically the computer languages were becoming uh, simpler and simpler in a sense that uh, to get the job done the amount of time and uh, even like uh, the learning uh, that was needed from uh, from the from the people uh, was was being reduced and I think that's uh, that's uh, the tragic trajectory for the future like uh, that people will uh, have like a lower bar for entering the the programmers uh, job uh, and everything will be becoming simpler like my vision from like long time ago when i still used to code i don't really code much anymore but uh, uh, i used to code quite a, quite a bit when i was uh, a student at elementary school high school and so on for for some time it was a lot of fun but uh, after a while, it became very redundant. I, I, I was feeling that I'm just writing pretty much the same uh, things again and again. 
And I felt like that the future of programming is that there will be no programming at all, like that uh, we will be just simply communicating with uh, with computers in natural language. Uh, I will just say, okay, I want this application to do this and this and this, and then I will get some output, and I will say, okay, you would have done this this part well, but I want to change this part and so on. And basically, using natural language, I think that uh, that's the future of programming. That we will be just telling basically the computer what to do. I know that that sounds very much like science fiction, or at least it did when I, when I was talking like this, like some 15 years ago. But uh, I think that we are actually moving in this direction because uh, the copilot, for example, that's actually a language model that uh, is trained on a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, source codes. And uh, uh, you can, for example, just write some some description uh, like in, in a command of a function of what it should be doing. And it will just complete the code because there was uh, maybe uh, 10,000 of people who are trying to solve the problem before you who actually did write quite reasonable code before you. So the language model can just repeat this thing. And I think that this, uh, this trend will continue so that uh, people will be more and more like specifying just what they actually want to be done and not exactly how it should be done. Uh, so I think that uh, that's the long, longer term future, that the same way as uh, almost nobody understands assembly language today, um, in 20 years or maybe sooner than the AGI will be here, uh, we will basically just uh, not really require programmers in the sense as they exist today, but uh, the bar will, lower, will be lower so much that people after like a couple of weeks of training will be able to actually code 50% uh, of things that are required from programmers. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from my perspective, um, how many of you write code every day? Uh, yeah, some of you, like less than half. Um, so for those, uh, those of you who don't write code, um, I actually think that, you know, software industry is so mature now that uh, programming is actually not about what it used to be 20 years ago. Today, we have so many libraries, so many tools, and the focus of the software industry today is on high quality. And so if you write code, you know, you spend 90% of your, of your time, you spend like, you know, handling errors and making sure that the, 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 the software is high quality and high performance and so on. And so the, the actually programming, like writing some, you know, uh, some, some algorithms and so on, that's a small part of it. And, and the creative part is even smaller. So, it's actually a very good uh, target for anything automated these days. So I absolutely agree that uh, the future of development will be, you know, me telling the, the software, this is what I want. And uh, the software needs to figure it out, including all the quality and all the kind of error handling and so on that we are all wasting time today um, and on. And, um, and also like, I actually think that the role of the developer will be to find the test data and being able to actually find that, uh, make sure that what I'm actually developed does what I wanted to develop. And uh, so, so it will shift from telling computer how to do it and how to handle all these kind of, you know, libraries and, and exceptions and so on into, this is what I want. And this is the data I want to give you and show me that you actually understood it and, and so on. So it's going to be fundamentally different, uh, different job and, uh, um, and the second part is that a lot of the development today is focused on, on kind of a high, you know, performance and optimization. We don't need that anymore. You know, we have CPUs, you know, my notebook will be good, good enough for the next 10 years. You know, there's no uh, office application that will ever use my notebook, even if it's not going to be fully optimized. So we don't need that. We just kind of can write, you know, um, less optimized code and that was kind of the story of assembler you know when you had like 16k of memory your code had to be super tight and super optimized and this kind of requirement for optimization and tightness of code is going down quickly and it's completely unnecessary now mm -hmm. so uh do you think it's the time for the developers to start i don't know like retraining or uh, how they should educate themselves or should they start now and uh, what should they be doing uh, today in order to you know stay on the um, cutting edge uh, not to become a obsolete developers uh, but uh, be on the front line uh, of the software development sorry your question was uh, about education of developers uh, yeah, uh, how they could or whether they should already starting educate themselves and if so, 
what should they look for or what skill sets they should adopt uh, in order to become or to be you know on the cutting edge of the technology and it's general or for or it's about uh, developers about developers uh, i can share our, our experience because mm-hmm. uh, we are focusing on application latest research from from ai and this is why we are strongly focused uh, on uh, experts which are teaching the technologies or uh, they are also focusing on uh, on on research and this is uh, this is uh, important in the context of uh, of finding uh, new technologies there are many uh, many resources where you can where you can see uh, new uh, uh, new technology algorithms and, and 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 so on and this is why uh, we are we are we are testing uh, this in in practice because uh, sometimes uh, you can see uh, good uh, technology but it's functional only uh, for for research and it's a long way for for application uh, to the to the industry uh, and uh, in in our company for for uh, for education is responsible uh, every employee and it's uh, up to them uh, which resources is is relevant for for them mm-hmm. okay so i was thinking whether we can give them some like you know advice which resources or what they should be you know maybe reading uh, or i think for every individual it's difficult to go to university and hey why don't you tell me what's the actual research so i can reuse it at work yeah uh one example uh one one part of our company are focusing on dna analysis and there are special uh special uh resources for example for for technology they are seeing uh, uh mit and for for genomic there are specific uh, genomic communities they are part of this this community they are using uh, sometimes uh, uh sometimes uh, communities on, on on social network it's uh, it's 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 very different case case by case uh important is that uh, that they are uh, they are connected uh, with with the community where, where they are sharing the, the latest research mm mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, when when I was thinking about it, uh, I was also thinking about uh, something like, as you mentioned, all these like assembler and optimizations, right? We all know all these developers that are um, closed in the basement, trying to optimize all the instructions. You know, they never see light, and they hate to speak uh, with uh, any user or customer, and so on. This sounds like a developer breed to me that uh, is someone who perhaps should start think about uh, or maybe I should have some skills like speaking with the people, getting their requirements, maybe some kind of shift over to a product manager or a product owner because that will be the the grow of uh, of of him, you know, understand what needs to be built and then embedding it to the software. Yeah, I, maybe I can quickly comment on it uh, on this because I I think that uh, that's actually true that people should not really be uh, be like uh, frozen at the point where they are, but they should be uh, looking at the trends and where where the future is. Of course, uh, the copilot was already mentioned that you can be using some machine learning tools to uh, um, automatize pri- part of your programming job. But uh, in fact, uh, if you think about the programming again, it's like uh, just uh, just to do something useful with the computers. Uh, the programming is just a way how to make the computer. Do do something for you that you want to be done, but they are in different ways. And uh, because we are talking today about AI, uh, I would say machine learning is uh, is a way like uh, how to think about programming uh, completely differently. Because uh, you don't need to write the code in the in like if then else uh, kind of format. Uh, mm-hmm. You can think of like a. Uh, just uh, having some training uh, algorithm and some training data where you are basically composing the program automatically and that's uh, that's I think how actually programmers can see a machine learning it's a it's a way how to create a maybe a very big program that is composed out of like millions or billions of parameters uh, where you don't really know how the task should be solved you just know that uh, okay this is like a, a set of inputs uh, that I get and this is the set of outputs that I want to get for each input basically what should be the expected output and between that is the program that I don't really know how to write uh, manually, but I will just find this 
program automatically. And that's what machine learning is, because uh, it just tries to basically produce the closest outputs to the desired outputs. And for some tasks, like say machine translation, it just works much better this way, because uh, people try to solve the machine translation by the standard programming approach. Like if I see this word in a sentence, I will do this, blah, 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 and so on. It didn't really scale, it didn't work, because uh, you require too many parameters. It became very, very complex, like spaghetti code type of programs, uh, where you had like many variables interacting with each other, and then it became impossible to, uh, to make any sense out of it. But once people started using like this uh, data-driven and statistical approach, uh, approaches, uh, machine learning, then uh, image classification, machine translation, now even basically like uh, some advanced web search uh, seems to be much more approachable by machine learning. So maybe that's also one uh, part more like a, a shorter term uh, future of programming where actually maybe much of the programming uh, people will just see differently from different perspectives. It's just, just basically some, uh, some, uh, some function that maps some inputs to some outputs where the function, the program itself can be found uh, semi-automatically. And then again, the programmer no longer writes the program explicitly, but just basically say, okay, uh, this is the input data, this is the output, and uh, when I see some mistake, I will maybe extend uh, the data, the training data, uh, or maybe I will just uh, do some some magic with the with the training algorithm. But uh, but uh, again, maybe that's uh, that's also like the future of programming that people will just basically see it as something else than uh, what it tradi traditionally was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually think it's a um, it's a bad news for developers because someone you know the tools can actually do their job. So maybe you know I I, I for myself believe that the kind of the AI and generative models will kind of equalize the, 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 you know, how much do you pay your hairdresser and how much do you pay your developer? They both use tools, you know? And uh, so if I drive truck to Brno, if I do like a development job, it should be the same salary, you know? That's, you know, what Mark and Reason says that, you know, in 10 years you will be able to buy a wall-to-wall -wall TV that will cost hundred dollars because the, kind of the IT kind of the design work will be effectively free. It will be done all by, by, by machines and you will spend million dollars on your, on your college, on your university, because that's going to be expensive. That's like, you cannot automate that. So yeah, I agree. Like, you know, it's uh, instead of, you know, doing if then, um, the, the, the machines will code. And, and the second problem with this is that, the software industry is some sort of an ecosystem or value chain. You know, you have you have the, the product managers and product designers and developers and testers and so on. So if you actually collapse it and you say, I don't need any of that, I can actually be my own developer and tester and uh, and product designer and, and visual designer because I will use AI, you know, suddenly, you know, you need different skills and the skills that are more people skills and design skills kind of, kind of vision what for the for what the software needs to do and uh, and again this kind of uh, you know what if and 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 so on development will be essentially essentially have no value and and it's not going to happen overnight you know it's like the same with the uh, with the um um you know the self driving cars you know it's not going to don't expect that we will not be hiring developer next year but the productivity will be go up going up so quickly and at some point this kind of uh, this ecosystem will collapse and the developer product designer and so on will be one person mm -hmm. thank you thank you so uh, let's uh, do one step uh, forward uh, and speak a bit about the technology infrastructure. Every software developer is uh, utilizing some hardware, software, uh, etc. So uh, I would like to speak about this uh, large language models and some kind of private instances or uh, this, not all the shared uh, models that are available to everyone, but uh, some kind of pre-trained models that uh, can adopt a specific uh, of a organization uh, that can not be shared with others uh, that can really needs to stay uh, within uh, within the organization so as we can see it now uh, we can uh, buy this pre-trained model somehow and then deploy it uh, either on premise or into our private uh, cloud perhaps is it do you think it's the time now to start doing this? Uh, 
train this uh, pre-trained model uh, models uh, for you know companies' private purposes and uh, and needs. Should we do five minute intro to the models? We actually jump right into it, and maybe maybe the audience would be interested to hear what's our definition and and how these models actually work. Is that would it be helpful? Uh, One minute. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Tom I I know yeah. that uh, Tomas can give us a good uh, explanation of uh, how this works, but uh, it takes two hours and he needs a flip chart or a board. We don't have the time or a board, <laughs> but uh, definitely yes. Well, it depends if, if really like if people want uh, <laughs> what the internet like, how, how long do you want it to be and uh, like a couple of minutes a uh, couple of minutes yeah yeah maybe maybe even shorter because uh, I just feel like I'm just repeating this uh, thing over and over again uh, so uh, maybe just interrupt me if I if I speak to to uh, in a too simple way but uh, basically machine learning is about like a couple of concepts typically you have the the training algorithm you have some training data and you have objective function. And uh, if we talk about language models, to be more specific, you can say that the training data, for example, will be the whole English Wikipedia, that's a couple of billions of words. And uh, the objective function of language models is actually to predict what is the next word in a sequence uh, or basic, basically in a sentence. That may sound like some ad hoc choice, but it's actually like very fundamental. I'm not going to go into details because there will be much longer uh, answer. So let's just say that we have uh, English Wikipedia. We know that we want to predict what is the, what is the next word in a sentence and uh, by the errors we actually teach uh, some neural network uh, uh, to be actually a good language model so if you have a bad language model and you will try to predict uh, what is the what is the end of a sentence like uh, the capital city of Czech Republic is and uh, basically basically a bad model will tell you that the highest probability is uh, for the next word is, for example, I don't know, like Brno or Ostrava. And while if the if the model is is really good, it will take, it'll tell you that it's uh, Prague. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, so again, like uh, once you have the training data that contains uh, some good uh, good information, that's also important. If you have uh, bad training data, you will have uh, the bad information in your models. Uh, then you have the objective function, then you have the model itself, and the training itself uh, is iterative. Uh, you will take some neural network that in the beginning is just some, some uh, mathematical function that is randomly initialized, it doesn't know anything, and then you do these predictions, you go through all the sentences in the Wikipedia, you try to predict the future words, and. Uh, and uh, whenever you do some mistake, uh, you propagate this mistake through the parameters of the model. You update slightly the parameters for each uh, if each uh, prediction, and then continually you do this a uh, couple of billions of times. So it actually takes uh, takes quite a while. And uh, after, after this uh, training is finished. Uh, you have uh, you have a good model that uh, again like uh, will acquire a lot of knowledge from uh, Wikipedia, so it will know like uh, who is the president of Czech Republic and uh, prime minister of uh, India or whatever. Uh, it will have like tons of knowledge uh, uh, just uh, just through the simple objective function optimization, which is like prediction of the next word. So that's like the like quick introduction to language models. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I hope it's enough. Yeah, and what's what's in, <clears throat> that's that I think that was helpful. And what is important to know is that in that example, like what is the capital of Czech Republic, what it is Prague, the model has no idea what Prague is and what Czech Republic is and what what is and is is. It's just predicting the word. And so the way you can you know if you're not from this industry, the way you can actually imagine it's that like if you run water through some river and then the water disappears, the language model is like the stones that are left there, they will tell you how the water went and where it went, and it actually statistically tells you, you know, kind of how the distribution water was. So that's kind of the, that's the, that's for me the the easiest, the way how to understand language models is that like, you saw the little stones left up by the water. Uh, if you have a lot of water going on, you know, you will have stones in certain configuration and it will tell you how it's actually gonna go next time. So. But again, this model has no idea what Prague is or what Czech Republic is and so on. And it doesn't even work at the, the word level, huh? It works like a sub token level. So it actually even breaks the words into smaller pieces. So that's, it's that's really interesting. It's maybe more like technical details, but uh, but uh, 
uh, the, like language models used to be based on words, like uh, basically whatever was separated by spaces was considered a word uh, because language modeling was mostly used for English and for English this, uh, this kind of works well and uh, before the neural networks the dominant uh, uh, techniques were based on engram statistics uh, so, uh, so this choice was uh, quite okay but with the neural networks we need to predict basically the full softmax uh, over the future possible words and because of some again technical details uh, I'm not gonna go too much into into it but just to explain why we have the subword so that we have basically limited vocabulary size so that it's uh, easier we need to learn less parameters and also like it's easier to compute uh, this distribution of like uh, 50,000 uh, predefined uh, words plus some syllables and so on uh, that's uh, that's better than having like full vocab vocabulary of say five million different uh, different tokens that can happen I can uh, also like uh, maybe just add that uh, that uh, I was doing uh, exactly this like in 2011 uh, like like when I was still a student and uh and uh, the paper that I did right back then, I think it was the first one uh, ever that was actually using this uh, splitting of infrequent words into subwords. Uh, and just uh, a fun fact, uh, I did submit it back then to ICASP conference, which has like, uh, which had like 60% acceptance rate and the reviewers did think that uh, this useless idea that will be uh, not really useful for anyone. And, uh, and you see like uh, now people just uh, talk about it all the time, so whatever. <laughs> Okay, Pavel, maybe, maybe for you, I would uh, adjust the, the question. So I think that's exactly what you do with the DNAI, right? You deploy uh, customized uh, models, not only large la language models, but other models uh, to the customer's premises, customer's uh, environments, and then train them for their specific usage, right? But if I understand it right, you start from scratch. I mean, like whenever you start with uh, the training, you do this from, let's say, the point zero, uh, et cetera. My question was uh, heading towards uh, that we would start using these like pre-trained things. So does this also happen uh, within your reality that you would use some something pre-packed? I mean, the main point uh, I'm looking for or, or trying to understand is that to create this pre-trained model takes a lot of computational power, right? Thomas said billions of words and so on. I imagine that uh, costs a lot of money to run this uh, through the CPUs and so on, so that not everyone can do it, right? But uh, if you do it once with large funding and then you start sharing it with the others, I mean like the output, then you can, you can effectively uh, lower the, the marginal cost so that it becomes more uh, useful and more accessible to the general public or general companies. So, so the question is like whether we are already hitting this moment when, when the organizations are going to adopt these pre-trained models uh, widely and whether basically we should do or start doing this right now. Mm, I think that it's it's right time because uh, our experience is that uh, that we are focusing on uh, AI technologies and we are we are like our like architects uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, about uh, combination uh, we starting uh, with uh, with infrastructure then uh, we need a strong database and sometimes uh, we need uh, historical data for for training uh, one example uh, we develop solution, for example, for prediction of e efficiency of turbo engines. It's for Honeywell in the US. And uh, this uh, solution is successful uh, because uh, we need historical data. Historical data, it was uh, 11 years uh, of experiences for creating CAD designs. And then uh, they measure uh, efficiency of every, every design. This is historical data. Then uh, we need also implement in this model uh, the, the specific knowledge, and this is physical law, which is uh, which is relevant for for turbo engines. And this data uh, we obtain from distinguished engineer, which have uh, 20 years of experiences with, uh, with with construction design, and we also need uh, classic mathematics and statistics for creating data for, for simulation. And then uh, we also implement data uh, uh, it from, from, uh, from knowledge of, of, of experts because sometimes uh, they have uh, experience uh, during 10 years. They know that this free, uh, free, uh, free things uh, in, uh, 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 influence these things. And this is also what we need to implement in this model 
and and then uh, model uh, is is functional. This is uh, one one example that uh, uh, our experiences about uh, historical data and combination. Not not only one AI technology, but uh, with with mathematics, statistics, and then uh, then we are able to succeed. And similar principle is uh, also from 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 other uh, from other industries. Uh, we need infrastructure. Uh, then, uh, then, then power for for training of, of models, historical data, and, and sometimes uh, something specific. And this is knowledge of of industry experts. This is our experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I hope you get it in the same way as I did. Uh, if you don't think about it today, you should start tomorrow because your competition started yesterday. And uh, now I think let's do one more step forward uh, in the agenda and let's think about uh, impacts and uh, relevances to data analytics as uh, even good data, uh, we are very much focused on, on, on data analytics. So there is this term uh, augmented uh, analytics that uh, is somehow defined as uh, it's the, the definition i was looking at gartner's definition of uh, augmented analytics and uh, frankly speaking it seems rather wide because it um, encapsulates everything from when ai assists in some data preparation and transforming uh, and then also when ai trans, uh, assists in some generating of uh, insights as well as it aids end users uh, to consume the analytical output so basically anything uh, that somehow works just next to the ai uh, can be considered as augmented analytics so many analytical platforms like Tableau, SciSense, ThoughtSpot with its NLG uh, has been already introducing or introduced uh, some augmented analytics in, a, in any way. Tableau just introduced this Einstein GPT. So uh, my question is, uh, if you can elaborate, what do you see as a key features uh, that would upgrade regular analytics as we know it without uh, super sophisticated uh, data science and machine learning capabilities uh, that would upgrade the regular analytics to augmented analytics that's uh, AI enriched? Yeah, I, um, I'm going to start. You know, I before we actually get to analytics, I, I do believe that, um, you know, um, again, language is, language is what makes us human, you know, and so that's why the LLMs are so, so strategic, so important. That's why you see so much hype about it. And uh, so not only analytics will be affected, you know, what will be mostly affected is anytime you communicate uh, zero language, it's... Uh, you know, good examples would be marketing, uh, customer support, customer success. Anytime you talk to someone about your problems, about your, you know, desires and so on, that can be actually kind of automated with uh, with AI and made better. And uh, you know, again, you know, these machines don't understand uh, what we want, but they are very good at guessing, you know, the next word, and that's kind of the the, the gist of it. And uh, so, so if you look at if you look at marketing, sales, and so on, those are very good examples of, of um, you know, customer sub support and help desk and so on. Those are good examples um, of, uh, of applicability of, of uh, LLMs, uh, logic, large uh, language models. Analytics as well. Analytics doesn't give you answers. Analytics give you questions. You know, what, what happened yesterday, and I see what happened, why did it happen, and why did it happen this way, and, and who caused it, and so on. So, again, we want to go deeper and deeper into analytics, and that's another good example of, uh, of applicability of language. And um, so the, the, the machine needs to understand us, what is it that we want, you know, be able to map it to the, to the specific data in our systems or in our world, you know, I can ask analytics about uh, specifically something about good data, but I can actually ask about the world, and uh, it needs to be able to uh, to decipher it. So, yeah, I think it's going to affect many many areas of of how we live. And uh, you know, as we said, the the advantage of having this kind of hype is that every hype kind of dramatically improves the 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 infrastructure. 
the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars spent in Silicon Valley in LLMs will make our lives better. You know, it happened in every, you know, it happened 20 years ago when we had the first internet bubble and it all crashed, but we had, we were left with tons of kind of, uh, you know, connectivity and, and, and routers and so on. So we could use it for other things. So this one, I'm not saying that LLMs will be the ultimate solution and it's, you know, we just spoke about it, how much is overhyped, but it will definitely in, drive investments into this kind of infrastructure in uh, tooling, in hardware, in, in uh, uh, GPUs and so on. So we will be able to put uh, language models, anything that we actually do in any, any aspect of what we do and, and analytics is just one of them. I, I would like to uh, also share uh, our experiences because we are focusing how to apply uh, AI like uh, like a service. Uh, we finalized the platform uh, for source for supply chain, and uh, you can you can see some some principles which is I think general also for for every industry. First is that uh, uh, you will be responsible for for strategy. Uh, every uh, I think successful solution must focus uh, on uh, on strategy and your plan, and this is important input uh, for for optimization. Then uh, you collect the data. This is historical data. For example, in in supply chain, it could be historical data uh, about uh, about your orders and and so on. You collect the data one one place. Uh, first role of, of artificial intelligence could be that check your data and find uh, if there is some uh, some irrelevant uh, things or uh, or missing data. Uh, they help you uh, with uh, with checking the, the, the database. Then uh, then uh, you collect uh, specific data, for example, uh, from uh, uh, from uh, your uh, your um, uh, warehouses, for example, data could be uh, how uh, how many costs are for for storing uh, st storing storing the goods. Then uh, you collect uh, also specific data uh, about your uh, your products or, or orders, and it could be uh, thousands or hundred thousands uh, parts. And you can imagine that uh, if you, if you are in in, in logistics, uh, that for every part you 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 have a supplier, and supplier give you uh, some price list, and this is also important data. And price list uh, could be every week uh, different, and you must collect this data. And this is super complex uh, system for for optimization, and this is a place where uh, artificial intelligence could help. And you obtain not many graphs, but uh, you need action. Action could be that help you uh, in the context that uh, for every day uh, create for you uh, the ordering plan. Uh, for example, uh, you obtain results uh, which uh, uh, is interrelevant that for your strategy, uh, need, uh, you need to order for example, 100 parts for this supplier for, for this price. Uh, you can use also artificial intelligence for demand forecasting, also for impact analysis. And this is what, what you mentioned, uh, because you can see uh, some strategies uh, in the in future, and you are responsible for selecting uh, which strategy is relevant uh, for, for your company. And this is principle uh, which we are seeing for, for every industry that uh, you can use artificial intelligence for, for your assistance and for helping you in the context of strategy, uh, plan, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And maybe I can also comment uh, because uh, uh, I actually also like uh, think that uh, this uh, this area of uh, data analysis will be will be impacted by by language models. Uh, uh, well, I'm not actually an expert on like what is the state of the art in in your in your field, but uh, I was actually uh, kind of like optimistic about uh, this direction really some time ago because uh, 
language models in my in my view are kind of like a often misunderstood technology because they on one hand they seem very simple you just predict the next word and then on the other hand you have like theoretical scientists who did like 50 years ago write uh, uh, articles about how, how language models are like a, a possible solution to agi how they are related to kolmogorov complexity minimum description length and these uh, almost philosophical concepts so uh, again i think that the uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding I, because I was in this area for like almost 20 years. I remember like the the language modeling winter where there was maybe like five people working on on language models uh, seriously in the in the whole world, like in the research community. And now it's the exact opposite. Like there are people who just say that uh, AGI has been already solved because the language models are so great. Uh, uh, because if they if they don't think, how comes that they can generate this uh, this cool joke and whatever? So I think that uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding. But at the same time, I think that uh, there has been often like pretty much the whole of my career, I felt that uh, there's uh, some huge potential in these models that are uh, that is still not being. Uh, being uh, understood by by uh, much of the research community or even general public uh, like years ago i did for example see that uh, you could uh, just replace uh, language models uh, using engrams by by neural networks in uh, in google translate and uh, it will improve the performance and it actually happened uh, i was at the beginning of this collaboration uh, what you mentioned in your introduction was actually like uh, like not exactly true it wasn't the word too vague that uh, improved google translate it was the neural language models but whatever uh, Sorry. But uh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> I know that I actually basically commented uh, on this when I was talking with some journalists maybe like five years ago, and I said like, okay, I did this word to back, and then it speed up a lot of things when it comes to computing some word representation. And then and then I did work on neural language models that uh, improved like uh, modeling the language, like the sequences of words, which led to like this improvement of Google Translate. And the journalists did kind of like uh, make this much shorter version, and it and they are like word to back improved Google Translate. You know? Yes. <laughs> okay, that, no, that's no. where this is coming from. You know, Obviously. And then somebody did write in on Wikipedia, and then everybody just keeps saying this. But it's it's, it's there. I mean, I, I, I know, can confirm. I, <laughs> I didn't write in myself, but uh, but whatever. But uh, back uh, back uh, to this. Uh, Kind of like a missed potential. Uh, for a long time, I did believe that uh, Google Search is actually a technology uh, that uh, again has been based on like something very old conceptually, and that can be uh, redone with language models. I think that now it's uh, much more obvious with, with this ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. Year ago, if I would be talking about this, people would just uh, probably think that I'm making it up. But uh, but I think it's now obvious that you can actually uh, answer complex queries much better with language models than with the keyword-based uh, search. I think this uh, data analytics is certainly like a, a something that can. Be be impacted in a huge way by by language models because as it was already mentioned uh, we as people think in terms of like words because our thoughts uh, are often expressed in english uh, in in, uh, in words in language uh, and uh, and I think that uh, uh, when it comes to, for example, understanding what uh, what are some trends uh, in the in the society, that uh, that's uh, that's what language models can be uh, great for. In fact, uh, last year we did even like a uh, start a startup with uh, with a couple of people uh, at the university in this uh, in this uh, direction because I think that uh, there's uh, really a lot of cool things that can be done with uh, with these conceptually simple simple models. Uh, again, like for anal analyzing trends, analyzing uh, uh, impact of marketing campaigns, and uh, and all these things so i think that's uh that's still uh, like uh, something that we will likely see in the near future, like one or two years. But uh, in the more distant future, maybe because uh, there's so much more content that is being generated when it comes to textual data and the internet and so on, uh, we as people don't really live any longer than 100 years ago. We don't really have like uh, 50 years of time to study all the books that were written about some topic. So maybe these language models will also like uh, become kind of like a kind of like a a technology that will summarize the information for us, kind of like gatekeeper to all the all the all the knowledge of the humanity uh, that we will use to kind of like distill all this knowledge into into a personalized content that will be that will be uh, available for us uh, for people to to understand much faster. So actually, it was mentioned that uh, maybe the college will be uh, like uh, uh, worth uh, all of our money in the future, but maybe even education will be actually redone by by uh, technology like uh, some personalized language models because uh, again. Again, what the teachers uh, do it's not uh, that much inventive it's very repetitive and uh, maybe uh, maybe actually uh, being able to give uh, students examples that maximize uh, 
the information that they actually learn during during the, the lectures uh, so that they don't get too easy examples because uh, then they are just wasting their time uh, and uh, not too hard because if you can't solve the problem you don't learn anything but just challenging examples uh, that I think that uh, in many ways can be done more efficiently with the automatic systems uh, and that's also maybe something that we'll see in the in the near future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, one thing I have to say, I absolutely agree that if you look at it from, you know, uh, you know, from distance, this, this, you know, language models looks like, again, simple. It's like statistical distribution of words that is kind of predicting the next word. But more you actually go into it and, and you see how it actually operates at scale, you know, when you, when you train it with billions and billions of, of, of relationships and words and tokens and so on. You know, this whole philosophical question comes up like, you know, does, is it how our brain works? You know, is it actually, you know, how we actually think, you know, or is it, is it, uh, you know, when we say it doesn't understand, maybe, maybe we are wrong. And uh, so I have a simple definition, you know, if you know how it works, it's software development. If you don't know how it works, it's AI, you know, that's very simple. So, um, it, it was a, a short note because you, you mentioned uh, personal uh, personalization, and this is what what also we are we are seeing uh, uh, like uh, important principle uh, in in application uh, uh, AI to the industry. Uh, one one example is uh, is education. Uh, we are also building platform uh, where we collect uh, many technologies uh, together. It's not only about uh, API on, on, on GPT, but uh, uh, this technology is on a small part. It's, uh, it's about, uh, about collecting personal data. Uh, we are using uh, the principle uh, digital twin, digital data twin, where in this context uh, you, can see, uh, you can see every student uh, in, in, in different way in the context of data. And you collect data which are relevant for, for the process. Process is uh, optimization of, of education. And you can, uh, you can use this technology for creating uh, data digital twin for every student. Then uh, you can uh, use uh, uh, the personal content. This is also very important because you combine, uh, uh, combine content from, from internet, but uh, sometimes you need specific contact content for, for education. Uh, you have target because, uh, for example, in the context of education, it's a big difference if you need to uh, teach some students uh, business English or if you need only order, uh, order beer in the pub. And this is uh, about uh, creating the specific context in, 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 your, in your target. Then uh, you can use uh, optimization. Uh, because uh, you collect data not not only about uh, about the target, but during uh, education process. Because if you create uh, some mistake, this is also data, and this is important data for for your data digital twin and for optimization. Uh, and optimization is important for uh, for efficiency of of using this uh, this this platform this platform. And in the end, uh, you can use uh, voice-to-text technology or some some avatar. You can combine this technology in virtual or, or augmented reality, and then you have complex solution which is uh, in in respect to your in in your needs. This is what what we are seeing uh, in in every industry, and it's uh, very important uh, create this this solution. Like, like like Lego pieces because uh, if somebody develop uh, the technology which is uh, which is more effective, you only uh, switch uh, one piece and then then you can continue. Okay. The message is stop making mistakes. Stop making mistakes. Otherwise, will be encoded encoded in your digital twin forever. You know so. <laughs> <laughs> make make no mistakes. Uh. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the education. Uh, it was also on my list, and uh, I think Tomas answered this uh, pretty much like the uh, like the answer. Uh, let's uh, jump into I, I guess like last uh, topic I wanted to go over. Uh, 
AI can do, or or even the models and everything can do like lots of good things, right? But uh, on the other hand, uh, it can also perhaps be misused to uh, many wrong things. There was this uh, open AI Senate Judiciary Committee hearing approximately a week ago with uh, Sam Altman answering uh, lots of the questions and, and so on. It took like three hours. I did not really watch all the thing. Uh, I just read a summary and uh, some key takeaways uh, from that. And one of the things were like AI regulation is needed. Then they also discussed the, the jobs uh, jobs issue, whether people lose jobs, etc. cetera. Uh, and then they had also lots of concern about the misinformation in the upcoming US elections. I guess uh, looking back at the Cambridge analytics and uh, elections here, elections there, this is a huge concern for everyone. How we can prevent uh, the, let's say, bad guys from misusing the technology uh, models, AI in general, to influence our society in the wrong way. Is there is there a chance, or are we already doomed to? I don't know what. Yeah, it's because we are doomed. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, uh, I think that every every technology can be used for like uh, good and bad pers- purposes because it depends on the on the person who's actually like uh, in charge of it. Uh, it's kind of like uh, that. The more uh, more powerful the technology is, the more like uh, serious the the. Uh, the concerns can be, but uh, I feel somehow that uh, the discussion about AI is often like uh, going in this negative way, like trying to just uh, like discuss too much the risks and biases and all possible mistakes and whatever and science fiction topics like that, uh, that uh, the humanity will be wiped out by some language model, but whatever. Uh, and uh, it just uh, seems to me like that it's uh, a little bit like a game, like uh, kind of like smoke and mirrors, uh, because uh, you often see that uh, there's uh, kind of like a pattern in the world if you would really look at the big things, not, not the small details, because you can always discuss like some 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 small things. But I think it's good to start with the big ones. And the big ones uh, are that uh, AI is a technology that is worth like tons of money. It's it's like generating already today. It's not a future thing, but it's already generating now a huge amount of money for like uh, big te- tech companies. Uh, uh, and uh, it's often uh, these companies that are kind of like uh, like uh, like uh, breaking the discussion about AI into like all these uh, not so much uh, important topics about like whatever some gender balance there and here in training data biases and, and so on and uh, and so spreading misinformation. But for me, the most important thing uh, is uh, the money, where the money is and where the money is going to be. And uh, in the context of Europe, I think that we are missing uh, a lot if we just limit our discussion on like biases and like dangers and regulations and whatever, because we are missing all the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you if you look at it, uh, uh, just uh, just uh, if I would uh, mention the companies that I was working uh, in, like Google and Facebook, they are making like uh, hundreds of billions of euro per year uh, from uh, from Europe. Uh, and they are not even paying tax- taxes here, and uh, much of their products are actually based on, uh, on machine learning solutions. So uh, they are making tons of money that they are not taxing here, and this discussion seems to be completely like uh, secondary to like some some uh, some like uh, you know, like like concerns like AI is a danger and we need to regulate it. What will actually happen if we actually play this game based on these uh, these rules? Uh, well, we will over regulate our own market. Uh, the companies that already have the monopolistic position will even get stronger in their position because, you know, like whenever you create uh, some really difficult, like, uh, like limitations of uh, whatever new technology does exist, you, you, you create obstacles for the new players, for, for the uh, new, uh, like emerging uh, companies that try to grow. Uh, while for the big companies that have tons of funding, it's easy for them to hire like 50 lawyers and they will just solve all these issues. But uh, if you are a small company or a startup, or if you are aiming to grow, uh, then it's always uh, much harder if you are like uh, in this in this uh, difficult to navigate environment. So I think that uh, when it comes to losing the jobs, I think that's actually the concern that we should have uh, as Europeans, because uh, if AI is a technology that will automatize millions of jobs, which I think it actually does have the potential to do, then the question is, where will uh, the money for these millions of jobs go? If it will go just to the U.S. companies and maybe some some Chinese companies, and Europe will just basically lose uh, all this uh, all this money again, 
then we are in a terrible position. Basically, that means that uh, much of the discussions that now, like European European politicians uh, do uh, do have in Brussels about like how we should limit this and limit that and blah blah blah. This is totally secondary. The main concern should be the money. We should be really trying to be rich. We should uh, try uh, try to be uh, like uh, self sufficient. We should uh, try to make sure that uh, this technological sector does exist in Europe as well, because we need to keep the people. We need to keep the data. We need to keep the money so that we have successful future. And if we don't do this, uh, then we will just be uh, kind of like a, a technological uh, colony of uh, of US, maybe uh, China as well, because uh, you know there are solely TikTok and these. Uh, these things coming coming from China, and I think that that's the biggest danger for us. Mm-hmm. That uh, there's a huge value that is being created worldwide, but Europe as a continent, I think that we are in a great position when it comes to our history. But our future, if we discuss uh, totally irrelevant things now, then we are just basically missing a lot, and uh, it, it can be like a big big concern. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think that I know the solution to this, and um, you know that's kind of a beyond my pay grade. But uh, 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 but uh, I, I do believe I I actually don't think that AI will put millions of people kind of out of job. I actually think it will free millions of people to do something more productive. You know, so we saw that always with technology that we never knew what the technology will bring and. Uh, um, you know, and it will, you know, we will actually kind of adapt and, and build something better and build a better society. Um, and again, you know, I'm not too close to European regulations anymore, so I don't know about that. But I do believe that, uh, um, I do believe that uh, the, the the danger of kind of a, a mi- misinformation at scale is real, you know, like, it's the, always technology makes stuff cheaper. So the, the ticket, you know, if you fly somewhere, it used to cost thousands of dollars. Now it costs $50. So, you know, in last election, you have to hire some people in in Russia to produce some fake news and so on. Now you can actually fully automate it with AI and, and language models and so on. So I don't think that we as a society are ready for that kind of a mass disinformation at scale where you have no idea when you read some news or you, you kind of, see something if it's real or not imagine what you have no idea there's no way you can actually say oh this is real and this is not real and um, there's space for manipulation and misinformation and so on so i i don't know how to solve it i'm not i'm not a big uh uh you know kind of a proponent of, of regulations i i agree with this but at the same time i see the danger and i don't know how we will deal with it as a society I agree <clears throat> with, with, with Tomáš because uh, most of our uh, application is in US and in Asia and Europe is uh, absolutely, I think, five, uh, sometimes more years uh, ahead of them. And it's, uh, I think, very important to uh, share good examples. And we have examples uh, definitively that where, where we reduce, uh, reduce, uh, reduce uh, job, job positions but sometimes uh, we generate uh, new uh, new working positions, and also uh, uh, we are seeing uh, how some uh, some companies use artificial intelligence for uh, obtaining big uh, big competitive advantage, and now they are hiring uh, another employees because uh, they are now uh, able shell their uh, their services or their products uh, worldwide. And this is very important, uh, sharing also positive uh, positive examples, because uh, many people uh, can can imagine uh, how to use uh, artificial intelligence in the context of using GPT, but it's not only about GPT. There are many, many use cases uh, for, for positions in uh, logistics, healthcare industry, also in, in, in public sector, and this is important uh, uh, sharing uh, good examples. This is my opinion how to uh, how to change the situation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, well, definitely. 
Uh, there are lots of use cases uh, while preparing for this. I also read and listened to a few things like how AI can help uh, reading the computer, tom computer tomography and read uh, human minds uh, and so on. So uh, that's pretty much it for the time uh, here for the discussion. We have some questions from the audience, so let's move on and uh, let's make it more interactive. So question number one, that will be uh, easy to answer, I suppose. How do we actually recognize AGI is here? I mean, uh, I think I'll let, uh, let him answer, but uh, hardly. Some people say that uh, we live in the computer simulation, right? So uh, perhaps it's already here and we don't know. But please, uh, what do you think? Yeah, maybe maybe just quickly. I, I would say uh, once uh, once we have the AGI, no, nobody will have to ask about it whether it's already here or not. It will be obvious. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Roman spoke about a new category of a developer who's also a product designer, a, a full product developer. If uh, let's say this way, are companies ready to accommodate this? I don't know. I don't know. I, I actually think that, uh, again, as I said, this is gonna. This is like a change in the whole ecosystem. You know, like how do we actually design and build software and so on. So it's gonna be a big transformation. But you know, we've seen this transformation in everywhere we go. You know, it's like uh, you go to you know you go to do some shopping and you see how the shopping changed over the last ten years and so on. It doesn't happen overnight, but. It will definitely, it will definitely happen that we will have a, a different software industry, and it's going to be structured fundamentally differently, less of a kind of a kind of you know value chain or, or kind of a, you know um, different jobs, more collaborated. And you know, for the 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 AGI for the kind of the uh, intelligence, there was actually a test for that, like the Turing test that was actually created even before computers existed. So we even have a test for that already. Good, nice. So one more question related to the to the programmers. Uh, if the programmers are going to be programming via optimizing input output, uh, wouldn't then break? Wouldn't that bring a lot of security risks? I guess uh, it can. I think that's uh, quite uh, quite some issue in uh, in machine learning in general. That uh, as uh, as we discussed already, it's based on the data, and once you have like all these billions of words in the training data, uh, nobody can go over it manually and check that uh, that uh, everything is like kind of secure and that there's no leak of some uh, some personalized uh, information or maybe some credit card numbers and whatever. You can make some rule based systems that will be able to kind of like uh, do some uh, like uh, some basic checkings. But in in general, it's uh, like quite quite a big an issue and. Uh, um, and uh, the same way as if you rely on some third-party tools where you actually transmit your data over the web to some data center somewhere in the US or some company that will be processing your data, that also like has a security concern. So I think that uh, uh, it because machine learning is kind of like a, in some way we can see this more abstract way of programming. It uh, it becomes harder to analyze uh, what will happen, what uh, what uh, decision was made, how, and uh, and also like uh, all these uh, all these things. Like uh, what is uh, all the information in your training data? Uh, where does your training data end up? Uh, uh, at and uh, even if you just share the trained models and not your training data, you also are possibly like uh, leaking uh, some information from your from your company. So I think that there will be a lot of issues of this type in the future, and uh, there will likely be uh, also like uh, companies and tools uh, uh, in the future that will be like aiming in this direction, like uh, making it sure that uh, that your training data is uh, is. Uh, like respecting all the regulations of uh, whatever EU and uh, and so on, and uh, the same way with uh, with big corporations, they also have a lot of regulations uh, for like uh, what information they can uh, they can uh, kind of like. Uh, uh, put externally out of their organization. So I think that uh, there can be a lot of anonymization tools and uh, similar stuff that will probably exist in the near future. Yeah, it's not going to be just legal. It's going to be the copyright kind of uh, security. It's going to be legal, copyright. Uh, when I upload my text to the language model, is it encoded there? You know, is it now becoming public domain? And all of these things kind of that... Uh, 
um, you know, again, it's impossible to test and check and so on at this time. So there will be many, many implications, not just for the developer industry, but software industry, but for the legal industry, for the security, privacy, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we are also seeing uh, this uh, like like big issue. And in the other hand, we are also uh, seeing that uh, uh, this is uh, also potential for creating uh, new new jobs uh, because uh, in future you will see specific products and companies which are address this problem helping you with with AI security we are also seeing uh, new positions for example uh, strong important is ethics and in future you will see uh, special positions which which focus on ethics psychology uh, also also philosophy and it's very important in the context of uh, ai application okay thank you um now this is a very practical question does it still make sense to study data analysis or what are the skills of future does it i think that uh, for sure it should because uh, uh, there's this increasing amount of data that we already discussed uh, and uh, being able to analyze the, these uh, huge and bigger and bigger data sets uh, correctly. That's, um, in my opinion, is going to be uh, like even more useful skill in the future. Of course, uh, just analyzing data doesn't mean that you just put some PCA or whatever, some simple, simple analysis. Maybe people will also have to use uh, modern tools like machine learning and some complex models uh, so that they actually can mine the relationships in their data uh, as well as possible. So I think that the uh, data analysis, in my view, for sure, is going to be uh, even more future, useful in the future. But uh, probably uh, people will just uh, also like uh, need to upgrade their their kind of like skill set. So uh, probably will just merge with uh, some basic machine learning uh, education, in my view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe that the fundamental, as, as we discussed today, everything what we are doing in in here is kind of statistical based. So uh, I think the study of statistics will be the most important study in the future. Like how the statistics distribution and all of these things that will actually help us understand how the world actually works. I, I also agree. And uh, in our R&D, uh, we are seeing a big difference. If we hire uh, uh, students or, or absolvents from uh, good technical technical university uh, with comparison with uh, uh, with employees uh, which start uh, for example with uh, non-technical uh, technical uh, university and teach uh, technology during uh, their practice it's a big difference because uh, technical students uh, uh, has uh, uh, I think good uh, good grant for 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 application and uh, we are seeing that uh, in the future very important is uh, critical thinking uh, creativity and uh, I think the holistic uh, view and also soft skills uh, because uh, very important is uh, uh, your uh, focus how to use artificial intelligence and I mentioned ethics sometimes uh, uh, we are applying uh, applying uh, AI and, and need uh, uh, soft skills because uh, you need to discuss with with, with experts uh, you need to involve uh, psychologists and uh, it's it's perfect uh, if, if you can speak uh, with with them it's uh, not uh, only about technical skills multidisciplinarity I think uh, will be also very important Okay, thank you. Uh, I have uh, two closing questions uh, that are some very really interesting. So first, uh, will politicians be the first or the last to be replaced by AI? <laughs> Simple question, first or last? <laughs> yeah. yeah, last, uh, last. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Also, I'm not that optimistic. I think that uh, the politicians will just keep uh, keep some way how to uh, look relevant. Also, I think that many of the things that they do are not that uh, 
that great or like that well planned in our society but i maybe we we should even like as a society a little bit overthink uh, uh the way how how we are like uh, organizing our governments because i think that we are focusing too much on the short term outcomes uh, and uh, it's just too easy to hack the current system if you, if you have a lot of money then uh, then basically you can uh, set up some kind of oligarchy because you will just uh, buy all the media you will spread your information to you through these channels and uh, you will just pe- tell people what they want to hear or if you want to manipulate their opinion you will do it through the media and uh, we've seen it in Italy with Berlusconi we've seen it also like here as well and you know like there's a lot of examples uh, all over the world uh, where you can see that if you can control what uh, what information people see then uh, you can control their opinions and their minds and uh, it's just too easy to be basically a populistic politician today and that's uh, uh you know like you are not going to replace it with some ai because uh, ai doesn't have any like motivations or goals on its own it's basically just a tool so i think that uh, the other way around uh, some politicians can misuse the ai to just uh, understand what are all these uh, uh, little things that people want you to say and you will just keep repeating it and you will be doing maybe completely opposite things but uh, that doesn't matter you can also like see that uh, politicians are like a uh, masters at promising uh, whatever they need to get elected and then they just uh, go and run wild and do whatever so i would also like say say it's gonna be maybe the last thing mm-hmm. yeah if you yeah if you look what they do you know they at the same time kiss your baby and steal your money it's difficult to automate you know yeah but maybe as as as, uh, as uh, pavel was speaking about the strategies and so on maybe we'll just like define as a society the the goals what we are trying to achieve and then the ai will generate the strategy for us and more maybe like few options and we will vote which one is the right that will be the elections about I, I like uh, the the the, the um, uh, no digital women. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like digital women. Uh, uh, your your question uh, before, I I, I like uh, like this, uh, and it's it's uh, important if you are asking uh, about Czech Republic or or different country because we are also seeing. Uh, in public difference uh, in the context of application AI, and. Uh, we are also focusing on creating. You, I, I mentioned digital twin, but uh, in the context of uh, your your avatar, and it's uh, I think the most interesting uh, for person with with high ego. And uh, I can imagine that uh, some politics uh, would like uh, implement this technology for creating their own avatar and and uh, and spread their uh, their influence and in 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 the question of of, of society uh, uh, i'm seeing uh, that uh, it's interesting also for for public sector because uh, uh, artificial intelligence also could help there for collecting data and also creating uh, some assistant system for some some predictions uh, for uh for uh critical situation for exa- for example uh for uh some uh some similar situation like in in covid and it it can help them uh with uh with finding a uh, right solution for the specific situation mm-hmm. okay Thank you. And the very last question, a very last question for uh, perhaps all of you. What are the craziest use cases you have seen for using AI? Crazy thing. <laughs> If you've seen any, I mean. <laughs> See, it's so smart technology that it's not used for yeah. dumb things. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I have to say that uh, I saw a a poem written about good data. It's so crazy, like how good it is. Like I would not be able to write poetry like that. So that's the craziest, you know, (laughs) like a chat GPT writing poetry is, uh, that's kind of my definition of crazy. Uh, For me, it's not so crazy because it's it's a very, very interesting uh, idea. Uh, We are now discussing uh, with with general managers how to use uh, AI for creating uh, 
their uh, own avatars because uh, they like uh, uh, yourself and they would like to uh, discuss with, with yourself and uh, discuss about the strategy about uh, their company. And some of them uh, think that they are best and they would like to speak uh, with... <laughs> With, uh, with uh, equal, uh, person, equal right? person, yes. Nobody is that equal as myself, so. <laughs> and I also want this. And well, I, I can think of one example where I would say, like in in like a crazy and positive way. I, I remember some research, like a couple of years ago when uh, people would use uh, these uh, these word representations to try to decipher uh, the ancient languages. Uh, which I think was like uh, crazy in a fun way, like uh, even like trying to apply uh, technology for like things that don't really uh, make money, but uh, it's uh, it's really like cool uh, uh, application of this technology if you can try to answer, uh, understand uh, some ancient civilizations like thousands mm -hmm. of years ago using machine learning, uh, which uh, crazy it is because you don't have really much data from, from those times. Uh, so technologically it's crazy, but uh, it can actually give us hints and it can uh, help us to even understand like uh, our own uh, like a uh, very distant history which i think is uh, is uh, is pretty cool and crazy in a fun way yep thank you yeah of course learning from the history learning from the mistakes uh, is is the thing so thank you for the questions there are still some questions that were unanswered uh, either we've covered them previously or for sure you will have a chance to chat with uh, roman or, or tomas and ask them uh, in person so thank to all of our guest speakers. Uh, thanks everyone uh, who come and came and join us uh, here today. Thanks to Haivan for planning, organizing. Thanks to our office staff and Monica for all the refreshments. Uh, also thanks to Jacek, uh, Patrick Braborec, Stefan Machowski and uh, our IT and all the people who helped to prepare this session. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I enjoyed the session. As I said in the beginning, next session isn't planned yet. So uh, subscribe to uh, all of the channels uh, that we have online. We will let you soon WhatsApp, uh, likely in form, right? Now we will all go for vacation during summer. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy some more time here in our offices. <laughs>